today on the fourth day of national level lecture series every day we are getting enlightened and inspired by dr sharad kare sir let us have today again new aspects about microbiology and biotechnology and how it is connected to our day to day life what is our role as a responsible citizen to uh um progress in our country thank you everybody those who are present here and those who are coming i hope everybody is learning a lot thank you so much for being here welcome dr kare sir please sir over to you thank you uh thank you very much uh, valentina and uh, it's nice that we are now halfway in our uh, uh, lecture series uh it is as if you have read my mind that uh, you added that uh, uh, two lines uh, i liked that introduction today saying that uh, you will come to know about microbiology biology and, uh, and biotechnology and how we apply that into the day to day life and uh, how it helps the country and that's what actually in my introduction today i am going to speak uh, for first few minutes on why i conducted because now we are on third uh, uh, fourth lecture today and you must be uh, you must be uh, trying to compare it with uh, some of the lecture series which you had in your colleges or some visitors and you you will have some made some opinion of course i have no quarrel with that you can make your opinion some people may like it some people may not actually like it 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 actually it's an individual perception and i am not really worried about that but i thought that let me make myself now clear after three days that uh, uh, what is uh, what are my views about this lecture series and i will expect that your views of lecture series although you will not be able to speak here uh, 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 you will not be able to speak here maybe in your feedback forms i will like to have your views about the lecture series okay so uh, as i told you this is not a classroom teaching i i never intended to have a classroom teaching i will not stick to any particular topic you must have seen that yesterday day before i talked on water uh, i talked on various aspects of uh, the uh, chemistry i talked various uh, basic aspects of microbiology i am going to speak more but there is not a really a particular topic around which i am trying to view my um, lecture series but i am trying to view my lecture series around a theme and what is that theme i will try to give the basics about uh, whatever comes in mind generally in syllabus Uh, uh whatever classroom teaching is there in your colleges or in your uh, institutes the teachers may not be able to um, uh, do justice to these basic aspects and something like that what i have been uh, addressing due to the paucity of time i do not use any powerpoint slides you must have seen that uh, what what is the reason because i firmly believe that the intent listening by students will be able to help them in focusing and understanding the topic i remember uh, in our, our time there were hardly any even not even transferences i am talking of my college days in 1970s um so 72 73 i was in amadnagar college and there was one dr sandorkar he was he used to give us the zoology lectures and you know he used to sit in the chair at exactly something like uh, uh 955 his lecture used to be the first one uh, and uh, he 955 he used to sit in that uh, chair and then he used to get up only at about 11 o'clock he never got up uh, from his chair uh, at one position he was sitting he was quite old he must be nearing his retirement when i uh, uh, he was giving us the zoology lectures but in those two hours he never used any chalk or uh, uh, blackboard or anything but the way he taught zoology i i, I will never forget that he uh, he was master of the topic there was no doubt about it and but more more than that he was able to convey 
through the words, uh, whatever he wanted to convey to us. I remember the way he taught us frog, the way he taught us the uh, cockroach, uh, because that time we had for dissection cockroach and frog. Uh, then the way he taught us the circulatory system, the um, uh, the brain, uh, the nervous system, uh, lymphatic system, uh, many of the things which probably I never read in my further uh, syllabus because uh, zoology was never in my um, uh, curriculum any time after that. But if you ask me to teach today's circulatory system, probably I will be able to do it. And that's because of that uh, excellent uh, lecture series, which I had from Dr. Sandorkar almost uh, uh, almost throughout the uh, uh, almost throughout uh, the uh, year, uh, he uh, kept us engaged. He, and one more thing, uh, all other lectures there used to be some kind of noise in the class, but in zoology there was not a single uh, time the class was disturbed by anyone. Uh, only I remember Dr. Sandurkar sir getting angry a little bit when he was entering the class. The, uh, the students didn't notice that he was entering the class. And so one person, he did something like this, a typical college boy act. He put his two fingers in the mouth and then he uh, whistled. So he saw that and then he came sad, he smiled. He asked that boy to get up and he said, you whistle like this, right? He says you shouldn't whistle like this for two for two reasons. One is that it's not ethical to whistle like that is not ethical. The second is that there will be plenty of microbes on your fingers which will go into your mouth. They may attack your body. You may fall sick. So please don't do it ever. Um, after a long time, something like forty years, I must have met that boy. Uh, of course, now he is of my age. And I asked him, do you remember this episode? He says, yes, Sharad, I vividly re remember that episode. And after that, you know, I never whistled like that. That's what he's teaching. Just two lines, two words. And this boy was very naughty. He never used to listen to anyone. But uh, the aura of Sanzar Kursar was such that he never allowed anyone to cross the limits. And uh, mind you, this uh, boy who crossed his limit also was not aware that sir was there. Otherwise, he would not have whistled. But one good thing happened that he never whistled like that again. He never did that naughtiness. So my point is that your intent with which you are listening to the lecturer, not only to me, to your classroom to your lecturers and all, uh, you should be very focused in your uh, approach. Once lecture is over, I expect that the student can sit down. He can try to jot down the points in the lecture and then read these points, uh, use textbooks, use other information. That way, if you study, I think that will get aged on your brain and probably you will never forget it. Uh, I, why I don't, why I don't uh, show PowerPoint is that one disadvantage of that is there is a tendency to get these lecture files rather than uh, concentrating during the lecture because you are sure that you are going to get that lecture uh, file from the teacher. So why anyway concentrate at the time of exam I will study and that's why I don't want to uh, really concentrate and that's what exactly happens when your PowerPoint studies are given. Sharing PowerPoint lecture with students, I, I feel that it is a breach between the uh, uh, student and teacher that there is a agreement between student and uh, teacher when they enter in the college, the student is supposed to learn and teacher is supposed to teach. Now this agreement, there is a breach of that. If the PowerPoint lecture is shared, uh, <clears throat> the teachers have to be well prepared while delivering the lecture, lectures and students have to be attentive. Actually, that's the teaching and learning should be. And I do not expect any type of PowerPoint shows in the classrooms. Uh, 
uh, of course, this is my perception. Power point points are best suited. I, I don't deny that it's an important technology. Power points are best suited for presentations, for uh, in the committees, in the seminars, in conferences, administrator meetings, where you want to make people aware of the happenings. And teaching is certainly not giving textbook images to the students. I find that many times on the slides, they exactly book is copied. Now they don't even take trouble of typing it with their own hand. The book image is taken and then put it on the slide. That is not the way of looking at things. Even the textbook cannot be imbibed alone. If you try to read the textbook, so why do you need teacher? And the teacher is needed because if you try to read a book without getting properly, <clears throat> I mean, advised about the um, lectures, uh, advised about the knowledge which is there in that book. Uh, and that is why you need a guru. Then experience of the guru has really no alternative while teaching. And that gets compromised when you are doing PowerPoints. So my sincere request to all the teachers with folded hands is, try to minimize the use of PowerPoint, try to have the uh, direct contact, direct conversation with your students, have a one-to-one -one, uh, talk with the student, and that is probably will create more and more interest in the uh, topic. <clears throat> one more aspect of this lecture series is to introduce some of the problems faced by our country. That day I wrote, uh, read, read out a poem about uh, Water. Water is really a big problem in our country. Uh, you go to the countryside and more than 60% people in India do not get really good water to drink. They either drink the brackish water or they drink the salty water. The pure good water to get is a, that commodity is a costly thing, not, not in money wise, but a scarcity also is there. Uh, the moment there is March or April, uh, we find that the ladies are going with the uh, um, these big uh, pots on their uh, head and they try to bring water and then try to satisfy the family. It's not a very good picture in 21st century. So this is a problem which is faced out by our country. The garbage problem is there. You look outside and you find that you are surrounded by garbage everywhere. Why this has to be there? When we are all learned people, we are uh, educated people staying in 21st century, why we should be surrounded by garbage? So that's the question to be asked. The global warming, the uh, unpredictable environments are happening everywhere. The unpredictable uh, epidemics are breaking out. Uh, and uh, this is actually a shame on our uh, uh, science progress, which is happening with a rapid rate. The way your mobiles are changing, the way your lap uh, laptops or computers are changing, there is a huge, uh, uh, what you can call a leap uh, by the science. And this uh, quantum leap of science is not matched by us. And that is why my uh, attempt is to try to take you to that level of understanding so that all these problems which are faced by our society, our country, and as well as the uh, uh, problems which are benign in the population and but get, they fail to get addressed. Uh, once I remember my teacher was teaching us the mathematics and he had given a very small sum, nice sum he had given that uh, there is a uh, water tank which is of 10,000 liters and getting filled up at the rate of 120 liters per minute and 20 liter per minute there is a leakage so how much time it will take and everybody answered 100 minutes but uh, i had my own doubts so i said uh, sir can i ask a question to you so he said ask so i asked him if the tank is leaking why somebody should fill it we should first seal the tank and then fill it then we don't have to do subtraction. We can have only one division and we can get the answer. So he said, smart boy, uh, our country, uh, you are not supposed to ask such questions. Of course, he said smilingly and because this question is a mark and everybody wants marks, not the knowledge what you are talking. But second thing he told to me in that age, very small age, was very important, very interesting. Uh, the way why I am talking to you today is probably because of the 
that uh, advice which he gave me he said that uh, uh, when you grow up when you grow up in your life you will find that the whole country is filling water in a tank which is leaking from all the sides and he is right we are we are having so many leaks in our daily life you can see that even your tap is leaking at home nobody really bothers to take care of uh, for two days three days your mother is shouting are somebody is leaking ko band karo but we are not really concerned about it you know if even if it is a 1 ml per minute it will be something like 365 ml for uh, 24 hours and 365 ml you can satisfy your thirst at least twice in a day so even one drop and uh, when it leaks it doesn't never leaks at one drop per uh, minute it will leak something like 100 drops per minute so just imagine 36500 ml that is 36 liter of water will get wasted just by a small leak in your house and we it is our duty to make sure that we don't lose such natural resources so again this is not going to be taught in a classroom or this is not going to be a kind of uh, uh, crash course uh, program so this you will have to learn and that's what i thought i will be able to bring these aspects of uh, your daily life uh, in front of you so that you will be able to address them uh, i will probably touch in my lecture global warming i will probably touch the today only i will probably touch on the food sector because food sector is very important how leakages are happening in our uh, country in fact i had an image from amdavad godown where there are something like 1000 parrots sitting uh, uh, in a godown and on the wheat uh, uh, these gonies which are uh, filled in the godown and at a time each parrot eats something like 5 grams of uh, wheat but at the same time when it breaks that uh, uh, gunny bag uh, it loses about 1 kilo or 2 kilo because when the person is lifting that leaking gunny bag there will be lot of losses so some 1000 parrots per day accumulate every day coming there are really causing a huge loss of grains i mean this is just a small example i gave you the plenty of wastage on the uh, dumping yard again i will be discussing that in detail when time permits to me uh, uh, about these problems so your syllabus probably does not discuss these problems but your teachers must be addressing them in their uh, talks uh, sometimes they talk extempore to you they may be introducing to you to this problem my intention is to generate enough curiosity in your mind to develop liking for learning and teaching uh, research and farming so these are three things i want you to develop a good uh, liking for learning and teaching i'm going to explain this i'm going to explain this in a uh, little detail i want you to develop good interest in research and i am going to uh, i will be happy that if you develop good interest in farming because in your life the creative activities uh, are these three how best you are to you can convey your things which are in your mind so for that you should be a good learner as well as a good teacher Uh, to look for the solutions of the problem which are there in your house right from your house to the uh, institutional level to the city level to the country level and to the world level and that's how nobel prizes are given to find out the solution for a problem which is hurting a, a good number good, good cross section of the population and that is what uh, research will help you so learning and teaching your student life will help you the research will help you in finding out solutions to the problem and a little bit farming i always believe that every person should do little bit farming in our marathi we have got a nice poem written by godi madbulgar which uh, uh, roughly uh, translated it says that uh, you have never taken a plow you are in your hand and you are talking about the uh, um, Um, meeting uh, i mean this is sorry it's a poem is by uh, mangesh padavakar kadina gheuna nangara hati pikavile satu mati tu namoti haya bhagya bhagve nesuna ghara sanyasuna dashi uthe shodisi uh, rameshwar uthe shodisi kashi you have never known how to serve the mother earth you have never taken a uh, plow in your hand and cultivated something 
uh, uh, I, that's why we are least bothered about the commodities. If the um, onion prices go up, we start shouting, but we for, forget to understand that uh, even at 60 or 80 rupees kilo, the farmer is not getting enough of uh, the money, uh, which we has uh, really put in like what people get in IT sector, there will be a comparison. I don't expect that uh, um, that uh, the prices will really uh, uh, soaring to the sky level, nor they can hit the rock bottom. But at a middle class level, you also should be aware. And why we are not aware, why we are shouting is because we have never done the uh, uh, serving of the Mother Earth by taking plow. Just imagine, just to grow some kind of a vegetable, either palak or methi or coriander in your balcony. And then two or three months it takes, a palak takes about one and a half month, methi takes about one and a half month. So probably coriander will take a little longer. If you grow bindi or brinjal like things, it will take three to four months, even five to six months also. But during that time, how much effort you have to put in? And then you will realize the efforts put by farmer. Farmer is one of the best scientists in the world. Farmer and mother, uh, your mother in the, your house, these are the two best scientists who are trying to create every day something new and uh, provide you that on your platter. And then your taste is uh, satisfied, your hunger is satisfied, and then you can attend to your activities. So these are very creative people. In uh, These are the best scientists in your, around you and try to learn from them. So these three creative activities of farming and this uh, teaching and researching, these are very important for our country. Uh, it's not necessarily that you should become a farmer. It's not necessary that you should become a teacher, but whatever you learn, if you go for a banking sector, you should be able to teach that banking sector to the people who are around you so that there are no money frauds, so there are no uh, uh, misappropriation of the funds. There is no taking advantage of the illiteracy or ignorance of uh, ordinary people and try to extract money for that. So that teaching will be expected from banking sector. A sports person can teach the students who are around in his uh, village or in his street and how to how to play. If they can see Sachin Tendulkar playing in a street with uh, uh, younger boys, I think they are going to get much more influenced. So it's not necessarily every time Sachin Tendulkar has to come, but there will be enough of uh, local talents uh, like all of you, you, you will have your own excellent talents and go to the younger generation and make them aware. So this is what is the uh, one of the meanings or one of the important thing of a lecture series. Now, when we are giving lecture series, you are doing something, people are going to say something. So what people are going to say, uh, I, I have written one poem for that. You can listen to it. There is a nice uh, movie song, I think Amar Prem, sang, uh, sang by Kishore Kumar. So the title line is something like that. Kuch to logo kahenge, logon ka kaam hai kehna. Like in the next uh, sent Kavita is different. It's not the same song. Kitne diwane the wo log, jo dunia badalna chahte the. Kya malum nahi tha unhe, badlav hi unke khilaaf tha. Kitne diwane the wo log, जो दुनिया बदलना चाहते थे क्या मालूम नहीं था उन्हें कि बदलाव ही उनके खिलाफ था जब पाश्चर भागता था कुछ पागल कुत्तों के पीछे लोग उसे पागल ही कहते थे उसको बीवी के जाके कहते थे कि आपका पति पागल हो चुका है लेकिन उन्हीं लोगों ने उसे सर पे उठाया और फूल बिछाए थे उसके रास्ते में जब उसकी बनाई लस ने किया था चमत्कार और रोका था जहरीले विषाणुओं को जिससे होता है रेबिस नाम का रोग कारोहर नाम का एक ऐसा ही पागल था जिसने छोड़े थे सारे सुख और सम्मान शादी भी नहीं की थी अपने निरक्षर और निराश बिरादरी के लिए धरती माता की सेवा कैसे करते हैं और उसकी रक्षा कैसे करे तरीके बतलाए थे सरल और आसान शब्दों ने उन्हें एक चमत्कार ही करके दिखाया था अमरीका के अलबामा क्षेत्र में आज भी याद करते हैं हम दिल से कारवर पैस्चर और कई ऐसे पागलों को जिन्होंने दुनिया ही बदल डाली अगर कुछ करना है मित्र मेरे तो अपने काम अपना काम विश्वास से करो विज्ञान के माध्यम 
कभी मत छोड़ो लोगों की तरफ ध्यान मत दो कुछ तो लोग कहेंगे लोगों का काम है कहना आप आपका काम करते रहिए यही मेरा दिस इज माय अप्रोच टू लाइफ दिस इज माय वे ऑफ टीचिंग दिस इज हाउ आई इफ पीपल क्रिटिसाइज टू दिस वेल इट्स इट्स अप टू देम बट दिस इज व्हाट आई फील दैट आई आई फुल्ली बिलीव इन टू दिस व्हाट माय टीचर टोल्ड मी टू बी कॉन्फिडेंट इनफ टू इन व्हाट यू आर डूइंग if you are confident and you are going ahead even if criticism is there well the criticism actually helps you the sometimes people will be uh, there will be enough of people who will never like uh, you to go forward but at the same time uh, uh, some of these critics uh, some of these critics will help you to progress if you take that criticism positively in marathi uh, we had one nice saint his uh, uh, name is sant ramdas uh, he had written nindaka se ghar asave shezari that means those who are criticizing you his house should be next to you so every time you are making they, they, he will find a fault with you and as many faults he finds if you are positive enough you are going to get excellent and excellent every day and probably at one day he will stop criticizing you I, in fact i will not not like him to be stopping uh, uh, will stop criticism because probably that will be the last day so let there be an improvement in your life criticism is it should be there but it should be uh, sometimes i feel that uh, 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 i uh, i'll come to that uh, point which i have in mind today i will tell you an excellent story it's a beautiful story of a scientist and this story is not uh, don't look it as a story it's a lot of science in that so uh, look at uh, in 1773 this person was born his name was augustino mardo bassi uh, he was from italy Uh, you can call him uh, Bassi because that's how the Italians will call Agostino Marlo Bassi. Uh, he was born on twenty fifth of September, seventeen seventy three, and uh, he was uh, he here he became very famous because he studied parasitic microbes theory. And you know, in seventeen seventy three, of course, he he must have spent some time in his school and college days. So it must be somewhere around eighteen hundred that he started his work on this parasitic microbe theory. That time, nothing was known of microbes. Uh, Leuven Hock came much after that. Louis Pasteur was about thirty uh, four years uh, younger to this person. So there was nothing known about the microbes. He studied law. Actually, his parents wanted him to study law. so he studied law uh, but at the same time he told his parent like dr baba i told you he wanted to become engineer uh, he wanted to become physicist his father insisted he should be engineer and he did that excellently similarly this dr augustino bassi he did excellently in law he was in fact appointed as a police commissioner in that area where he was staying the name of the place he was staying was lodi if you go to italy you will find lot of uh, memorials of augustino bassi so this uh, please do visit uh, his memorial at lodi uh, i have not visited but uh, i will certainly like to visit sometime that in my lifetime he studied agriculture he studied medicine he studied physics he studied chemistry he studied mathematics he studied natural sciences because he wanted to do that a decade before dr louis pasteur discovered pathogens dr bassi had shown a particular disease in silkworm is caused by microbes is contagious can be transferred by a sterilized needle the pathogen responsible was a fungus which grows in inside the uh, silkworm the first contagious disease was this you know he was fortunate he was fortunate in his college days he was taught by teachers like spelanchi Uh, if you have read a little bit of history of microbiology uh, you will know who spallanzi was there was uh, in 17th century there was a huge uh, fight going on between two pools the two groups of scientists whether the life came from life or life came from inner things the one theory was called biogenesis the other theory was called abiogenesis and spallanzi was the one who was strongly supporting the 
theory of abiogenesis. He, he, say, he simply disbelieved that life can be uh, just like that created uh, out of nothing, uh, out of inertness, uh, life will not be created. So his, Spallenji was his teacher. There was one Dr. Scarpa, those who are in the field of medicine, they will know who Scarpa is, one of the best anatomists uh, uh, who was teaching him anatomy. Dr. Volta, you know Volt, Volt is the unit of electricity. So Volta, the person who discovered this, who uh, actually proposed this, he taught him physics. So he, he had a very good uh, a team of teachers and because of his varied interests, they were surprised. This boy is studying physics, this boy is studying mathematics, this boy is studying biology, this boy is studying medicine and actually his degree is in law. So uh, all that uh, they were surprised, but that time it was permitted. So he concentrated. Uh, uh, what happened is he uh, initially uh, took out that police commissioner job, uh, electoral college law uh, job. But uh, after a few years, he started losing his eyesight because he never stopped reading. He always used to read these science books. Um, whatever they are available. And so he left that uh, job and he came to agriculture because he thought that the field work will uh, reduce the tension on his eyes. So he came to field and he started ship farming. He took some marine, uh, this merino uh, type of ship. You know, in Italy, merino type of ship are very famous for a particular wool. So he bought some 400 ship and started cultivating. I mean, breeding them, uh, started uh, nourishing them uh, to raise the ship for uh, wool. But when these ship were mature and they had a very good amount of wool on them, the price of that, uh, unfortunately, wool fell down in the market at such a rapid rate that he had to sell those 400 sheep for mutton. He, he couldn't really make money out of that wool. So, but the genius of in him, what, what he did, he wrote a book on how to do sheep farming, how to breed a good sheep, which sheep will actually yield a twin, which uh, which will bear a twin. He could predict, he had developed a method to predict which sheep will develop a twin. Then, uh, uh, and that book was very well received by the scientific community. Then he went to the potato farming. In potato farming, because he lost in the ship, so he went to potato farming. The moment he went to potato farming, he did a lot of work on potato cultivation, the type of conditions which are needed, type of potato diseases. And he gave a lot of methods to stop those potato diseases. And he wrote a beautiful monograph on how to cultivate uh, potato. In that time, there was one professor scientist, his name was Giovanni. Uh, I think Gilbert and this uh, 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 this Gilbert was a scientist who was an agricultural professor and he has his original idea that you can fertile, make the land fertile uh, without uh, adding any fertilizer. So he wrote an essay on that and people were started uh, uh, crowding around him. Then Agostino Bassi, what he did, he did some experiments. He showed that it is not possible to develop the, uh, to for, make the soil fertile without manuring. And then he uh, wrote an essay, a guide, how to get that uh, um, uh, soil fertile by cultivating certain, some of these leguminous plants. And uh, his uh, essays then were appreciated by a lot of scientific community in Italy and France. Then he came to cheese manufacturing and again he excelled in that cheese manufacturing. Look at uh, this story, such an inspiring, such a uh, beautiful story. Wherever he was touching, like a touch of Midas, uh, the Midas the king, you remember that he was wherever he touched, it used to be bold. Of course, it became too much and then he, when his daughter got uh, converted into a gold statue, he realized the, uh, the in this case, I am talking of touch of Midas is only from the positive angle. Whatever he was touching, he, it was becoming gold and he was able to unwind that because he was very uh, passionate student. Uh, unless uh, you are a passionate student, you can you cannot never excel. So in cheese manufacturing, he developed such a good variety. Even today in Italian cheese, if you ask for a Lodian cheese, that is the method developed by Dr. Bassi. And it still continues after 300 years 
uh, that's a credit to a person. Then he took up wine making. Uh, after cheese, he was successful. He took up wine making. France and Italy were the two uh, very prominent uh, countries in that uh, European uh, continent, which were supplying wine to most of the Europe. And, and the grape wines, uh, uh, they were mostly in the uh, French area, but the wineries were more in Italy. And uh, there were a lot of uh, wine making procedures. So uh, our Dr. Augustino Bassi studied these procedures. His wine became very popular, you know, in any wine, a particular strain of yeast and how you handle that yeast. It's something like taking care of say, the, the same uh, product you give uh, vegetables, uh, same vegetable, uh, same masala to Valentina and to other Jui, and then they will cook in their own way and the taste will be different. The uh, Valentina's uh, vegetable taste will be different and Jui's vegetable taste will be different because there is a procedure and the procedure which he was uh, obtained, I mean, which was followed by Basi, although he was using the same Saccharomyces cerevisiae strain uh, without knowing that it was Saccharomyces cerevisiae, he, he was successful in getting very good uh, flavored wines. His wines became very popular and not only that, he was the first uh, <coughs> scientist in that uh, area who developed the wine from oranges and from uh, the Morella cherry. Morella cherry is a small cherry which is found in Italy in plenty. So he made these wines uh, uh, from the orange and Morella cherry and their flavors were also appreciated by the entire um, uh, France and Italy, that continent. The Then actually is the peak of his career. Uh, what I told you is only the steps we were, he was going towards the peak of his career and then came the peak of his career. But this peak of the career had initially a very huge slope. And while climbing that slope, he felt that he was, he had defeated. Uh, he was defeated. In fact, he was on a verge of stopping all that work. That story is about the silkworm cultivation. In Italy and in France, there was a huge amount of uh, uh, silkworm cultivation. Italy is known for famous for silk also. So there were these silkworms grown by uh, local people. And he guided people with uh, good practices for mulberry cultivation. Mulberry he brought in to, for the, uh, he found that mulberry is very good for the silkworm. So he brought some good varieties of mulberry plants. So he tried various species. And then uh, there were there was one disease of this uh, silkworm. That disease was known as calcinito or calcino or muscardine. These are the synonyms. This muscardine, or you can call calcinito, uh, for from 1807 for next three decades till 1837, he was working on this silkworm. And as I told you. The, he, he did plan experiments, beautiful experiments, environmental testing. He studied silkworm systematically because that was uh, yesterday I told you about that author, Arthur Halley. He, whatever novel he was writing, if he was writing on electricity, he will go to electricity company, sit there for hours together, observe people, what they are doing, then understand the business and then he will come and write it. Like that, this Agostino Basi anyway was a scientist. I mean, Arthur Alley was an author. He, Agostino Basi was a scientist himself. So he studied this silkworm very nicely. He, he actually dissected silkworms. He tried to understand their system. He saw the, uh, he brought different species of mulberry from various parts of the world and then tried to develop a good multiplica, I mean, uh, cultivation practices for that. Uh, and everywhere, and this is what I want you to draw your attention to, that wherever he, whatever he was doing, he was writing a, a SOP, a good standard operating procedure. He wrote standard operating, he, was, he wrote a monograph on potato, he wrote a monograph on wine, he wrote a monograph on sheep. Whatever he did, he wrote a monograph, he used to submit it to University of Pavia, that was the university which he was attached in his uh, native place. And that university used to support him with uh, publishing all these monographs in the form of research paper. So it is actually a documentation which is there even today after 300 years, you can read this documentation. So here in this uh, silkworm, 
yeah, thinking that his knowledge, uh, he lot he accumulated a lot of knowledge, and uh, he had spent a lot of his own money. He was not a money-oriented person. I'm going to tell that a little later. He was not a money-oriented person. He spent a lot of his own money while doing this research. And then they, he, when he accumulated enough money, there was paucity of funds. So he thought that he can sell his knowledge. And then he will sell these monographs. He wrote two monographs, 1835 and 1836. One was on the diseases of silkworm and the other was on cultivation of silkworm. And he held that information back, thinking that he can make use of money so that he can look at some other research project. Somehow nobody came forward to buy his information. So he got tired and he himself came uh, one day. He went to university and submitted those two theses, which he had written three, four years ago, and asked them to publish it. They were published. Uh, but uh, the real story is I have not told you. Now I will tell you that. In 1807, he started this work. Till 1815, he was not successful at all. After eight years, he found that he was at square one. He was not able to solve the problem of silkworm disease. He was not able to get a good mulberry plant to feed this. And all his eight years uh, uh, experience or whatever work, whatever money he had put, whatever hard work he had put has got wasted. So he decided that in 1800 and, uh, 15, he decided now is the time to stop because all money was getting exhausted. Let me um, uh, uh, change the topic. Then suddenly kind of enlightenment happened, intuition happened. In his brain, he was thinking, see, it must be, I, I don't really believe intuition has come suddenly. Intuition always comes if the, you are thinking about the problem uh, in your subconscious mind. Uh, you will be able to uh, always think about that problem. And then at some stage, the solution will strike to you. And that must have happened in case of Dr. Augustino Bassi because he was a scientist. He was breathing that time silkworm. He was uh, drinking silkworm, not literally. What, what I mean is while breathing, he was thinking about silkworm. While drinking, he was... Uh, 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 thinking about silkworm. So he was, silkworm was always in his mind and uh, disease which was there in silkworm, it was on his mind. So uh, he, uh, uh, in these eight years, he had already uh, done a lot of experiments, but this is the uh, real story that these experiments, which he did in first eight years, they were based on two assumptions and these two assumptions were wrong. So you are trying to build up a theory on wrong assumptions and you are trying to prove it, you are going to get disappointed because original assumptions are wrong. What were these two assumptions? These two assumptions were that the, um, the too much acidity causes dissolution of the tissues which are within the silicone body. And uh, the, second, the first assumption, I mean, second assumption was the disease starts spontaneously. I told you that there was that time domination of uh, biogenesis and abiogenesis. So abiogenesis lobby was stronger. And they used to think that all these small organisms, they are generated spontaneously. So this uh, theory of abiogenesis, the disease starts spontaneously from various environmental factors. They could be the food for silkworm, they could be the breeding methods, uh, they could be weather. And these are the conditions which will actually cause the springing off of these uh, uh, disease agents. And that's how the silkworms are getting disease. So that was the hypothesis. And the second hypothesis, as I told you, was too much acidity causes the dissolution of tissues within the silkworm body and they die. So it's a curse of nature. You can't help it. Because the body itself develops too much acidity of that silkworm. It's a very small worm. I don't know how many of you have seen silkworm. Uh, that uh, body of the silkworm will uh, uh, get dissolved. The tissues inside, it will become hollow and then it will die. So that was the second assumption. And he was all the time, first eight years of his life uh, in this field, he was trying to prove that. This failure for eight years uh, is invaluable experience. And for me, what you have to learn from uh, Dr. Bassi is not the success, but the failure. 
this failure of eight years is an invaluable experiment for scientists all over the world. You must know uh, the scientific logic before planning experiments. That was the conclusion. You must know the scientific logic before basing your experiments, before planning your experiments, before conducting your experiments. Are your experiments on sound uh, level? Are you thinking on correct line? You should be clear about that. Then in 1816, he planned to stop all that. But one fine day, he had, as I told you, in, uh, uh, and then his, uh, he was watching this silver for eight years which were dying. There was a white layer, you know, in your uh, rainy season, you must be seeing on your shoes or on bread, there is a fungal growth, which is a, like a white fluffy growth happens on the surface of that shoe or the bread. Exactly similar type of uh, the white fluffy growth was growing on the um, uh, silkworm. He never noticed it. I mean, he must have noticed it, but he never thought about it. So he suddenly one day had intuition that silkworm, which is attacked by outside principle. There was some outside principle that they were knowing, but this outside principle must be that white growth, which is happening on the silkworm disease. And the moment it came into his mind that uh, uh, the, uh, he took out a syringe and he took out the sterile syringe. There was a concept of sterility that time and heat was the agent for sterilizing the needle. So he put that heat, I mean, uh, needle into the hot, uh, on the hot stove. And then uh, with that needle, he took out that, uh, uh, with the cool needle, he took out that uh, white fluffy growth and touched a healthy silkworm. And suddenly he found that the healthy silkworm also developed the disease and died. And then he did repeat this experiment several times. And he thought that, that the, uh, this is the contagious uh, principle, which is responsible for this. Then he took a microscope. He observed that white fluffy growth under the microscope. And then he concluded that it could be a fungus called Boltritis paradoxa, which was known at that time. Uh, um, and then this paradoxa, it actually flowers. And these flowers, what he called flowers in his uh, research paper, we know today that they are spores because fungus was not known that time uh, to that extent. Uh, but uh, uh, although there was some introduction to the uh, thallophyta in, in the plant kingdom, uh, fungi, algae, and uh, these uh, lichens were probably known to some extent, but uh, this uh, botrytis is responsible or the spores are responsible for block blocking the uh, lymphatic tissue which is there inside the silicone body, which is getting blocked. And that's why the insect is dying. So he was sure now that the factor responsible for the disease. He could not classify the fungus, which was later done by Dr. Balsamo Prevalis uh, as Boltritis bassiana. So in honor of Dr. Bassi, he called this uh, fungus as Boltritis bassiana. Later in 1912, it was reclassified as Bavaria, uh, Bavaria Bassiana, but that Bassiana name was continued by Dr. Uh, uh, Willem, who classified this uh, fungus in a Verticillaceae family. Uh, those who are uh, who know fungal classification will understand what I'm talking. So they they could, they could identify uh, uh, they could identify only after about 200 years after. Uh, uh, Augustino Bassi, but that till that time people were give, I mean, his credit is still not taken away. That uh, fungus is still known as Bavaria bassiana, and then he gave some SOP for prevention. I would like to draw your attention to this. This is very important. He, he wrote that egg should be carried in a sterilized cans because you know that silkworm cultivation is done by those eggs are born so and then the eggs are converted into cocoons and then the cocoons will try to uh, view that uh, uh, silk so the eggs when they are brought they should be carried in sterilized can that is the first time he used the word sterilized. Then dilute calcium chloride, alcohol or dilute nitric acid may be used to clean the egg surface. 
Now this king, uh, a person who is doesn't have a very uh, big lab or at uh, that time anyway the labs were not very big. Not there were not many chemicals also available in 1700. We are talking. So how to think about it? And this is what is the original thinking. Uh, to, maybe I will tell you to take one or more occasion and talk to you about Dr. Carver, how he had uh, uh, created everything from zero. Similarly, this Augustine Obasi, he used some chemicals like calcium chloride, alcohol or dilute nitric acid to clean the eggs and mind you, they are still used till today. After 300 years, all the instruments uh, in the nursery, he read, wrote that they should be washed with boiling water and whatever possible, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, wherever possible, you can actually dip it into the running, uh, in burning fire so that whatever microbes are present there, they will get uh, killed and the nursery will not get affected. Well, ventilation in nursery should be healthy while entering nursery, they should sanitize their hands. You know, the sanitization of hands in Corona, you are all aware. Now you must be tired also of uh, again and again washing your hands. But um, uh, in Indian culture, the washing, the moment you come from outside, you have to wash your hands and feet. And <clears throat> this is a, uh, a very simple ethics of any Indian house, a cultured Indian house you go. When you enter, they will say, Aap haat pae do, haat pao do ke aaye, aur aapko hum kuch chai wara de denge. So haat pao do na, ye uh, is a first microbiological principle in any um, any part of the world. Augustino Basi was the one who introduced that in Europe. So he said that you please sanitize your hands. And he shows how deeply he had thought about the disease. But but there was an opposition. After so much of study, after so much of work, so much of intense work he did, he wrote those two theses. He kept away the money interest and he published. The moment he published that, there was a huge cry that they, all this is umbuck, all this is not right. So <clears throat> what Dr. Bassi is telling is all mm, hearsay and they are not right. So there were opposition. And the opposition was so strong that uh, the Pavia University then uh, appointed one committee. You know, uh, there is a saying for the gold to undergo, uh, when prove that it is gold, it has to go through fire. So, Marathi Dami Munta, Sonat Sakatla, Tari Techi Zharali, Yenasati, Tala Agit Zawla. It has to enter in the fire, then it becomes really that uh, the brightness comes on the gold. So uh, same thing which uh, Dr. Bassi had to face. So this opposition was so strong that <clears throat> the uh, university appointed an expert committee in 1834 to verify the results. Uh, some of these scientists will take it as an ego. Mera results ko kaun challenge kar sakta hai? Dr. Bassi was not like that. He welcomed the committee. There were nine professors from various disciplines. There were physicists, there were chemists, biologists, there were the medical doctors in that committee. So the nine doctor committee came and visited Augustino Bassi. For six months, they were there. He showed them silkworm, he showed them, introduced the disease in front of them. It took some days for disease to appear. Then he cured these diseases by, so all this time he took, and then the uh, committee uh, concluded they had four conclusions, beautiful four conclusions. The white layer is contagious and can spread other on other healthy worms. The solutions which Dr. Bassi suggested for prevention actually prevented the disease from spreading. spreading. It should be used immediately when the disease is visible. Even the layer on the dead form, uh, dead worms can spread the disease. So white layer is the real culprit and white layer can be tackled by the methods of Dr. Bassi. Nine professors signed this report, which was later authenticated by the registrar of the university. Dr. Bassi printed this as a first page on his report. The reports were retyped, reprinted, and then Dr. Bassi's name was written in the golden um, uh, letters in the history of science. That's how the, my dear friends, uh, now, in, in this story of uh, Dr. Bassi, 
you have physics, you have chemistry, you have biology, you have mathematics, you have <coughs> medicine. You know, in 1837, after 1837, his eyesight further uh, deteriorated. He, he lost his eyesight almost completely. He was not able to use microscope. So did he stop? No, his research continued. Between 1844 to 1853, he published he published almost 25 good papers on smallpox, typhus fever, plague, rabies, gonorrhea, syphilis, and gangrene. During that seven years from 1937, when he lost his eyesight almost completely, till 1844, he worked very hard. He worked very hard on these diseases, which were supposed to be caused by the microbes, but nothing was known about that. But he studied all these diseases, and then he published good papers on that. These papers are again named in front, uh, in, in the, I mean, are present in their uh, the literature of science uh, uh, in the name of Dr. Agustin In 1849, cholera was rampant in Asia. He, stu he studied this disease and wrote that causative agents are much smaller and thinner than silicone disease. And you know, after 34 years after he wrote this, the Dr. Koch, Robert Koch was who discovered Vibrio cholerae. And then he uh, asserted what Dr. Bassi was observed was right. Dr. Bassi had suggested that time quarantine measures to stop the spread disease of the, uh, we are today saying that how this quarantine will stop. You know, uh, you have to learn from history. Uh, Dr. Augustino Bassi uh, gave, has given the rules of quarantine, how to segregate, how to keep them away. The patient should not be touched. The patient's clothes and vessels uh, should be washed with boiling water. That time there was no other uh, sanitizers available. So put it in boiling water and he has even recommended that some of the undergarments of the patient should be burned because you don't have a way of uh, making sure that they are completely washed. So uh, the bacterial number could be very high. He, he didn't use the word bacteria, but he said that the number of causative agents would be very high. So you can even burn it and quarantine was suggested. So he came in a lot of money as a successor. After all these years, uh, in 1838, his, his brother was count in the Italian uh, emperor's uh, palace, and this count died, and he had named uh, Dr. Bassi as his successor. So he came, uh, uh, he got a lot of treasure. But you know what he did at that treasure? He all distributed that treasure to those students and those who are needy in creating laboratories, in making facilities available. He, he must have won a lot of prizes in gold and silver. That time, gold and silver medals used to be actual gold, silver medals. Even he all melted all those gold and silver medals. The moment he used to come home taking a gold medal, he used to dis uh, melt it and then sell it as gold and um, give that money to the needy students. Never in his life he accumulated money, but what he accumulated, I don't think any, uh, even Kuber can earn that kind of fame which Dr. Augustino Bassi has uh, uh, achieved in his life. He, he was publishing till the age of 80. At the age of 83, he died on 8 February 1856. This is the genius. This is the genius and this is what we have to learn from such geniuses. So Augustino Bassi is probably is one of one such figure. If you read <coughs> history, if you read history of science, you will find, and this is what I want to tell you again. There is no real barrier. When I say microbiology and biotechnology, actually I don't mean any particular subject. I mean science. So when Valentina was asking me, sir, what will be the titles of your lecture? I cannot give any title to the lecture. The lecture is basic understanding of the science. Uh, coming back to uh, the today's problem, uh, food. Food is a major problem which is faced by India. Let us talk of something about food irradiation. Let us talk about something like food storage. 
how best we can preserve our food, how best we can. Uh, yesterday, I was, I forgot to mention that I got a mail again from uh, that boy, Mohit, and he, he himself did some uh, pressure cooking at home and he has cooked dal. And he said, sir, I am surprised to see that the dal is cooked without any whistle uh, given. Uh, there is another mail which I received from one girl. Uh, she, I think, mis mistaken this as uh, uh, whistle, uh, as vessel. So she asked me, sir, how to cook without vessel? I said, I don't know how to cook without vessel. I said, I, I said clearly that you should not allow pressure cooker to whistle. Whistle is city. City, agar uski nahi hona hai, so maybe her understanding was not right. I don't want to downgrade her or anything. It's, uh, it's good that she asked so that her uh, ignorance will be going away by uh, this answering this question that it is not the cooking without vessel. A pressure cooker will have vessel. Pressure cooker itself is a vessel. There will be inside vessels also. So it's not without vessel. It's without vessel. Okay, so that's how we are talking. Somebody has wrote uh, to, to me that uh, I want to understand the procedure. I thought I was very clear in giving an elaborate procedure. In fact, some of you must have got a little bored also. Are sir, itne kyu detail bata rahe ki wo city kyu na ho, kaisi na ho? Itna detail procedure kyu bata rahe? So I will request that girl who has asked me about the procedure for. Uh, there are two uh, emails. One is for asking for the how to make the model. And I'm happy that Valentina and uh, the, uh, I think, uh, Juhi, they have made the model and they have shown that uh, picture to me. So good. Uh, and uh, they are, somebody asked you that how, what is the procedure to go? Uh, unfortunately, these, uh, my uh, Ditto lectures are available. Word to word lectures are available in YouTube. I don't know for how long they will be there, but right now they are available. So my request to those who are asking these questions for details, please go through my yesterday's and day before lecture and you will find that I have given the procedure to the later. Uh, say detail or procedure nahi de sakta mein. Itni detail procedure mein wo dono lecture mein di hai. Aap suniye lectures wapas. Agar phir bhi aapko nahi samajta hai, pick up the point which is you cannot understand and that you ask me why this tape is to be used and then I will answer that. Okay. So coming back to the, uh, but I'm happy that there is a, a slowly the responses are coming um, uh, and I expect that uh, today after reading this, uh, I mean, uh, listening to this uh, excellent story of Dr. Agastino Basi, many of you will start becoming creative in your mind and try to bring more and more ideas in your daily life so that you also will become one day at least part of Dr. Agastino Basi. So uh, the, when the food irradiation concept came, see, uh, you know that I am a scientist from atomic energy. And for some years, I had food irradiation department with me. The, uh, of course, uh, food microbiology was uh, very close to our heart, especially dairy and food microbiology. The book of Frazier, I have read completely uh, from my MSc days. So I used to like food microbiology. Uh, food is something which uh, is uh, so scarce and which is so, uh, uh, I won't call it scarce these days. Maybe in the uh, 60s and 70s, there was a lot of uh, problem in India. And then Indian farmers did wonderful thing with Dr. Swaminathan and Dr. Norman Borlaug. And there was a green revolution possible. And when uh, European scientists had written that the India will get wiped away because of the infights for hunger uh, uh, in the 80s, we started exporting wheat. We exported wheat for five years. When in 60s, we were importing that Milo, uh, which is a very bad quality Jawar, which was fed to cattle in uh, Western countries. They used to send it to us. So from that to Green Revolution, our farmers did uh, convert, uh, uh, I mean, did uh, make a history and uh, they produced a lot. But after producing a lot, uh, the problem with India uh, look at onions. Now the onions are costing something like 80 rupees kilo. 
or maybe in some places even 100 rupees kilo sometimes the onions will be 10 rupees kilo sometimes the tomatoes will be so much in tomato that he cannot even harvest tomatoes so he will allow that uh, uh, red mud to be there and they will get destroyed naturally they will get degraded naturally so to that level so why this uh, disparity happens in our country year after year why we are not good in processing why we should what we should be doing more for processing and for my suggestion will be more of decentralized processing like my uh, decentralized waste treatment i will also say that decentralized waste i mean food processing is very important in your own house you should be able to uh, save some of these uh, seasonal uh, fruit seasonal vegetables seasonal uh, uh, the grains which uh, are available only for some part of the year you should be able to preserve them correctly and you should know the preservation procedures you know sometimes you bring the grains and you apply a lot of boric acid or a lot of these uh, they call it mercury tablets in fact they are not mercury tablets but they are popularly known as mercury tablet because if you add mercury in such a tabular form into the uh, tablet form into that grain you all will die mercury is very poisonous so it's not a mercury uh, there will be some very small fraction of mercury there which will be vaporizing and mercury is not allowed anyway for full food preservation so if you are using those tablets which are having that fraction or so of mercury please don't use it uh, boric acid uh, when you are using in rice and there is a possibility this boric acid will keep on entering in your body what exact information what exact results it will call or effects it will call cause in your body may be known after 20 years by that time it will be very late so why try to introduce these chemicals in your body and try to make this uh, as uh, there is a, in india we have got a very good sunlight the uh, rice cannot be kept in sunlight but wheat can certainly be kept in sunlight the dals can be kept in sunlight these lentils can be kept in sunlight you keep the lentil in sunlight in hot sunlight in uh, say summer months especially april in india april is very hot in uh, i am sure in rajasthan gujarat the uh, may and june also are very hot so keep your lentils outside and um, you will find that there are no insects at all even after one year or two years so use these methods the <clears throat> the concept of gamma irradiation Uh, people are just afraid of the moment i say atomic energy is used for radiation the first uh, myth is that whether the radiation will uh, get deposited now let me tell you that radiation doesn't get deposited we are not adding isotopes isotopes can be radioactive like say p32 isotope is there tritium is there c14 is there so these are the isotopes these are materials and no materials are used for food irradiation for food irradiation the irid radi- radiation which is coming from a radiation source like cobalt 60 or cesium 137 these are the radiation sources which are actually uh, <clears throat> giving out gamma rays you know uh, mary curie had uh, discovered radium and radium used to give three kinds of radiations alpha radiation beta radiation and gamma radiation when an alpha radiation goes out of the atom the atomic number will go down by 2 and atomic mass number will go down by 4 suppose uranium uranium is 92 is the number and let us say 235 is the atomic mass number so when alpha goes out the number will become 231 and the mass number the atomic number will come down by 2 so that is 93 and then a different element will be formed and this alpha particle will be going out when beta particle goes out actually the electron goes out but this electron is not the orbital electron which is there uh, around uh, what uh, or i mean in the orbits of uh, atom these are the nuclear electrons and where are the nuclear electrons nuclear electrons are not free but a neutron degrades and when neutron degrades one proton is formed one electron is formed electron is ejected out and proton remains there so when the beta particle is emitted the atomic number will actually go up so if you have got a carbon 14 the c14 the c14 means there are six protons and eight neutrons normally in a normal uh, non radioactive 
common atom that is C12, which is abundant on this earth. In this C12, there will be six protons and six neutrons uh, uh, and six electrons. But in this C14, which is a radioactive atom, there will be six protons and eight neutrons. Now, this imbalance is responsible for instability of this nucleus. And uh, the atom will try to achieve that stability because every system, according to the law of thermodynamics, will try to achieve a uh, stable uh, state. So to get that stable state, one neutron has to get uh, degraded. So one neutron gets degraded and it is uh, proton is uh, remains into the nucleus and electron is thrown out. So now there are seven protons in this. So seven proton is no more carbon, it becomes nitrogen. So when carbon-14 is uh, degrading or disintegrating, the word is for radioactivity is not degrading, it is called disintegrating. So when the C-14 is disintegrating, its actually number goes up by one and that is called beta particle. Now these are called particulate radiation, these are actual particles. And there is the electromagnetic radiation, which is not a particulate radiation which also can be thrown out by in a radioactive atom and that is called gamma radiation. Now this gamma radiation, this gamma is somewhere in the range of uh, smaller than X-rays as far as frequency is concerned or wavelength is concerned. If your X-rays are having a wavelength of something like one, month, one Armstrong, these gamma rays will have a wavelength of 0.1 Armstrong. So that is in that range. So it's in a solar spectrum also, you find some of these invisible rays the, on both the sides, uh, infrared side, the far red, and then uh, the radio waves, microwaves. And on the ultraviolet side, you will find some of these X-rays and gamma is also of course they don't reach us because of the uh, various covers which we have got and that's why life is possible on the earth so this this part of a spectrum at a very uh, left side at very not, uh, small wavelength but very high energy so these radio gamma rays have got good energy good uh, they, they have a interaction with the uh, microbes and they can produce these uh, photolysis of water. You know, all the cells, uh, when gamma radiation is passed through the food, the um, microbes which are there, the cells or the spores of them, <coughs> they, they will contain some amount of water. And this radiolysis of water will be taking place and they will produce free radicals. Now, these free radicals are the uh, entities which actually generate these uh, small, uh, uh, what you can call the species like H2O can produce various types of free radical. They can produce H free radical, they can produce O free radical, it can produce H2O free radical, it can produce HO2 free radical, H3O free radical. There will be plenty of them, O free radical. So these free radicals, and what is the definition of free radical? It's a a very short-lived entity, something like 10 to the power of minus 12 or minus 15 seconds, that is the lifetime. But during that lifetime, when they are coming back to the ground state and they are no more free radical, they will impart some energy. And this energy, if it is imparted to a protein molecule, a double bond or a triple bond or something like a nucleic acid, they interact, they will cause the... Uh, degeneration of that molecule and the molecule will lose its stability. The molecule will no more be active. And because the molecule, the DNA or protein is no more active, it will, re it will reflect in the death of the organism. That's how the killing takes place. Now, this is a straight interaction of gamma rays into the food. So there is no question of deposition of any of this uh, 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 radioactivity into the food. So please remove that uh, fear in mind that radioactivity is uh, uh, getting deposited in the irradiated food. No, it is not. In fact, you know, uh, US and Euro uh, in US and in Australia, when they import fruits from uh, abroad, they insist that the fruit should be irradiated because that will kill the insects which are there within the fruit. And these insects will not be introduced in the ecosystem of either America or US, I mean Australia. They are very particular about the contamination of their agriculture with these uh, tropical insects. Uh, 
uh, <clears throat> these tropical insects can get established in some of the warmer areas of either Australia or America, and they can cause problems in their agriculture. So they are very particular that such uh, insects should not be brought, and that's why they have made this uh, um, uh, agriculture, I mean, uh, irradiation compulsory for import of the, and that's how the India exports about 750 to 1000 metric tons of mangoes every year. They are the Shara mangoes, they are Hapus mangoes from uh, Kokan area, the Shara and Langda from uh, and Kesher from the northern area. These are now irradiated at uh, three or four different places in the country. And American uh, inspector is an Australian inspector. They observe this uh, irradiation process, make sure that everything is right, and our farmers can get more money for their uh, uh, mangoes. So, like mangoes, the there is one uh, radiator in Washi, irradiator in Washi, that is called BRIT. BRIT is the board of radiation and uh, red or board of uh, radiation uh, isotopes and uh, radioactive materials. And this is responsible for supplying the various uh, radio isotopes to the hospitals as well as to these food irradiators. The food irradiator, what is the source required? It is cobalt 60 or cobalt 60 or cesium 137. And these sources are provided by BRIT, these radio isotopes which are required in hospital. The, you know, without radioisotope, life would have been very difficult, especially for cancer patients because radiation treatment and radiation diagnosis, both are playing a very important role. And that's how the uh, India is self-sufficient. In fact, we are exporting a lot of radioisotopes to uh, the neighboring countries, to the SARP countries, as well as to many of these African countries. Uh, the <clears throat> radioactive isotopes are, daily transported these uh, medicines. They call it as radiation medicine. So those medicines, as well as the sources for the uh, radiation treatment, which is to be given for cancer patients, usually the gamma ray treatment is given. So these, uh, uh, we call it as babatrons. These babatrons are developed at uh, our uh, local level and they are supplied uh, even some uh, hospitals in uh, some district places government hospitals they get this as a um, donation from the department of atomic energy and that's how we are trying to use this uh, radiation both in the field of food as well as uh, in the in already uh, in uh, uh, medical treatment. So radioisotopes have really found a uh, important application and the initially it began with onion and potato irradiator. So that uh, um, uh, irradiator which is in Lasselga is also used for irradiating uh, the dog food in um, irradiating some of these normal commodities, especially spices. You know, uh, sometimes you get surprised that uh, uh, haldi, which is itself anti antiseptic, uh, but uh, it is itself antiseptic, but you will find a lot of insects growing inside that haldi, especially the uh, unground, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, haldi, halkunda, we call it in Marathi, I, I put that, uh, what it is called, but it's a haldi as it grows in the field. When you bring it, after drying it, it will develop a lot of insects inside. So to pro prevent that, the uh, clove or the silaichi, uh, this dalchini, all these uh, uh, masala uh, or the spice things, they are quite prone to insect attack. So they are irradiated and most of these spice irradiator, which is there in Brit, it uh, exports these spice, spices. So there is nothing, um, uh, Again, it's a question of your uh, understanding. It's the question of the Nirakshira Vivek, which I call it. Uh, if you, there is a Rajahans, and this Rajahans, you keep a water and milk as a mixture in front of it. It will only drink uh, milk and water will be left back. How it is done, I don't know. It's a, probably a poetic idea. 
but that vivek is very important that you should be able to distinguish what is good and what is bad for the environment if it is good thing for the environment it is good for you and if your logic and i will say all your dr agustino basi i told that story today it was all based upon the uh, uh, wrong assumptions so he started with the wrong foundation so the building is anyway going to collapse but if you are having a good thought yes plus and minus uh, i remember the story of dr carver since i got some uh, few minutes more i will tell you that story the uh, and i will come back to radiation again and dr carver was a uh, black scientist uh, and he was very Uh, respected in his community uh, in fact now for me he is a god whether he is black he is white it doesn't really matter for me because he is a human being and the way he served our human being he needs to be treated he needs to be worshiped as a god he uh, he left all these uh, prestigious posts which were there uh, in iowa university and he came to alabama where there was a school for these uh, the uh, american black citizens and he started teaching there when he joined that school there were only three students and when he died there were 30000 students in that alabama university uh, what he did he did a wonderful agricultural revolution in fact mahatma gandhi had uh, communic- uh, correspondence with him and he had recommended what type of diet uh, mahatma gandhi should take so that he can uh, maintain his health uh, through these uh, very uh, troublesome fights which he was having with british empire so this uh, dr carver he uh, he was the one who is actually i can call it as father of organic uh, farming he uh, asked uh, his uh, students because alabama county was famous for uh, cotton but in this cotton growing area the cotton production was coming down and then when dr carver reached here he took the uh, soil in his hand and he tried to check it through his fingers a lot of soil started falling down which is called as the uh, uh, mineral uh, less soil so there was no organic matter there and it was more of the uh, aluminium silicate so it was falling down without uh, getting stuck to his hand uh, if you have got a very good fertile manure uh, organic manure in your soil if you take it in hand something will stick to your hand it was not happening more sandy soil was there so he started growing the leguminous crops and then after taking leguminous crop when he grew cotton he got three times the yield and then people started believing him even the white farmers started believing him and then he asked them to grow a peanut then the peanut crop came in such a large quantity because everybody believed carver and carver had advised them to grow peanut so the whole area was filled with peanut and there was no taker for peanut because in america nobody eats peanut so what to do again they started shouting at dr carver ye aadmi ne log kuch to log kahenge logon ka kaam hai kehna ab ya to unko karan bhi tha shouting karne ke liye इतना सारा हमने सेंग पैदा किया अभी इसका क्या करें तो देन ही नेवर सेड दैट नाउ इट इज योर प्रॉब्लम ही लॉक्ड हिमसेल्फ इन द लैबोरेटरी एंड इन दैट लैबोरेटरी इट फॉर थ्री डेज एंड थ्री नाइट्स ही डिडंट ईट एनीथिंग ओनली फॉर टॉयलेट ही यूज्ड टू कम आउटसाइड एंड ही यूज्ड टू ड्रिंक सम वाटर एंड मिल्क एंड देन बेस्ड ऑन दैट 72 आवर्स कंटीन्यूअस वर्क ही प्रोड्यूस्ड समथिंग लाइक 120 प्रोडक्ट्स आउट ऑफ ग्राउंडनट you know peanut butter today that is made by uh, dr carver he made 120 coco he peanut milk he made uh, peanut chicken he made everything was tasting he made his students sit and uh, served them this peanut chicken without chicken it had got a beautiful taste of chicken and how he did it i i am i don't know but he did that it is written in his uh, biography and then with these 120 products the american senate asked him to he applied to american senate i want to show you this so the senate committee was sitting in a um, five star hotel and the five star hotel uh, people the front door 
was not allowing Karmur because he was black. They asked him to take an entry from backside. He was so uh, angry. He was in tears. He said, I could have left. This was, I had come for them. But if I had gone back, my brothers would have suffered. So he went from backside. He had not eaten anything. With those two bags, with 120, he had to actually circle around the hotel. And that heavy things, he put it on table. And this committee laughed at him. And they said, you have got seven minutes to tell us what is there in your bag. So he said, OK, fine. In those seven minutes, gentlemen, my dear students, the way he explained things, the committee chairman said, sir, he asked, he said, sir, to him. That was a great thing. Sir, there is no restriction on time. You go on talking. He talked for seven hours on groundnut. And at one o'clock in night, when the committee concluded, they signed the bill for bringing this as a tariff crop. And getting a tariff crop in America is a very laborious process. Takes sometimes years. Carver did it in seven hours. And that is the greatness, my dear students, of such people like Augustine Obasi, Dr. Karwar, Dr. Baba, Dr. Abdul Kalam. You have to learn from these things from them. The, get this inspiration. This inspiration is very important. I like that uh, Mohit today, he said that he will make such models and gift it to his college. It's a very important thing that what uh, you ask so many questions, what college has given you? My question is, what you have given back to the college? Have you given something which your college will remember forever? That is what is important. You, uh, you uh, always expectation is not good. You must return also. And this is the uh, return gift. You must give it to your college, make a, a model like this. If this Vasundara is made, and so and so batch has made this Vasundara. I remember our school used to have uh, competitions for us. No wall on the classrooms was ever empty. They used to ask us, "You, whatever you bring on a written on paper, it will be stuck on the wall. So some people had bad handwriting, some had good handwriting, some were good draw, drawing, uh, good in drawing, some were bad in drawing. They used to do something and bring it and put it on the notice paper, I mean, on the wall. <clears throat> Some students used to laugh, make fun of it. But what that created, that, that spirit has created, that yes, you must try to put something good so that people will appreciate. Finally, what, why do you, will, why do we, why, you know, what is the reason why we live on this earth? One of the reasons is, is it only earning money? My dear students, money has only finite value in life. If you have got two vakt ki roti aur ek achcha ghar hai, to usse jyada paise ki koi kimat nahi hoti hai. Usse jyada paisa sirf chinta paida karta hai. But if you have got a good satisfying experiences to tell people that do this and then you will find this, you do this, you will find this. Aur ek chota sa bachcha hota hai, Lego set leke, kitna achcha kaam karta rehta hai. Look at his face, he is so engrossed. He is not worried about anything. He wants to create all the various... Uh, figures from that uh, Lego set and he gets satisfied. He knows that it is going to be broken next time, next, within five minutes, but he doesn't stop at that. That should be the spirit. You should be curious like a child and you should always develop your intelligence. Thank you very much today. Uh, <clears throat> or tomorrow, we will certainly have a different topic. Thank you very much. Back to you, Valentina. Back to you, Valentino. Gee, sir. Namaste, sir. Thank you very much for enlightening us. Our uh, today's lecture started with a Kishore Kumar song, Kuch Ta Log Kahenge. And, sir, I remembered Rabindranath Tagore told us, Tari Jo Haak Suni Koi Na Ave To Ek To Jane Re. So, without worrying about the people, what people will talk, 
we uh, are highly inspired to start our work today we have started this uh, uh, plant from uh, microbiology department indian science and in science college uh, as i told you don't seal it don't seal it today yes sir seal it after two months yes. yes sir it is open right now Okay. And uh, um, as you have instructed and you have guided us, we'll put uh, about seven to ten ml water, uh, and uh, we will be able to grow it in a very maintain this ecosystem in a very very nice manner. Uh, today, so many staff uh, people, faculty teachers also asked me. They are also going to start one such model at their own home to inspire into their own society. so this is how we are learning from you sir uh, very nice to listen the uh, whole history of augustino bassi and all other scientists it was very very good to learn that failure is not failure but it is the stepping stone thank you so much everybody uh, see you tomorrow in the fifth lecture thank you sir namaste sir namaste